You know, it's interesting to me, and I, I think Craig did this too. I'm not 1,000 sure. So you sort yours by publisher too? I used yep. to. Now, now I sort them just alphabetically. Okay. Yeah, I used to do it just alphabetically, and just in, in a few years back, I uh, divided them up into publisher then alphabetically. So I used to do the whole, I used to sort by publisher. I kind of did the exact opposite. Um, and it's just because I literally gave up on trying to figure things out for myself and I just do what my app tells me to. But uh, I used to sort by publisher. And so then I got the CLZ thing and I sort by that. And so now I don't separate by publisher anymore. But I will say like, I do miss the aspect of- It's, um, it's just crazy talk. You want <laughs> Batman and you got to go to D for detective comics. It's just crazy. Makes no sense. Um, but no, like I miss, it does cut down on the, I miss the aspect of, okay, this is a Marvel book. So I know it's going to be in one of these like 14 boxes instead of, you know, it's going to be in one of these 30 boxes. Um, but because everything's out, I don't know. It's there, there's, it's like a balance. There's a, it's a catch 22. There's good things about it and bad things about it. Well, yeah. when I did it, what really surprised me is I didn't realize how many uh, image slash, you know, independent books I had versus yeah. the big two mm -hmm. because I, I had a ton more, you know, independent books than I did the big two. And I didn't even realize that until I divided them out. So do you, do you sub, uh, sort by independent publishers or is it just three different? Just three different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know why you have a, see, I'd probably pull image out of that and then do all everything else separately. You know, you know point. why you have more independent books and you do big two? Because those are the ones I buy. Or well, because you have a very refined and uh, well-honed taste in your books. Um, so you haven't been listening to me talk about my '90s comics. <laughs> <laughs> I, was trying to, I was trying to. I was trying to throw you a, a <laughs> compliment there. Don't don't take yeah. it away. Um, yeah, you, that's uh, that is misplaced. You know who else has a very refined and palatable taste in their uh, extracurricular activities and their uh, call it enjoyment. God, are you gonna talk about Snoop Dogg again? No, not Snoop Dogg. I'm going to talk about our listeners, the folks who listen to this podcast. Um, and this podcast being the Southern Fried Geekery Podcast. Um, welcome back, everybody. This is episode 142, and we are glad to be here. Uh, especially, you know, we made it another week, and in 2020, <laughs> that's the the struggle seems to be real. Um, I right. am, as always, Caleb Alexander McKenzie. Matt Trogdon. And I'm Craig Lance. And it's good to hear your voices collectively. And it's good to be heard. Hey, I, I like doing that. Um, for those of you who are at home, maybe you've never listened to our little, our humble little show before. We are, we're SFG, man. We talk about comics. We talk about comic culture. We talk about a lot of shit. Um, we care about the books we talk about. So we talk about books we care about. So um, we also care about those of you at home. And we know things are hard right now. Uh, <laughs> the collective weight of the world seems to be crashing down every other you know hour uh this year so but we hope you all are staying safe staying healthy uh taking the right moves to take care of yourself um we want that for you because we like you we, we care about you um how are you guys doing this week mm, it's been a long week um you know uh don't know how deep i want to go into some of the stuff that happened but uh Let's just uh, maybe add a the suicide awareness number to our uh, show notes. If you're suffering from depression of any sort, reach out, people. If you need if you need to reach out to us, you know, do so. But reach out to someone. That is there's a, a lot going on in this world, and it's hard to take it all in right now. It's a very good idea, and I just left myself a note to do that. Um, so yeah, we'll stick that in the show notes. Um, Matt, your week going okay, buddy? Yeah, I had a very bright spot in my week. Um, I think we can all celebrate uh, the uh, Frank Herbert's Dune 2020 movie. The trailer landed. So yeah, it is uh, time for celebration. I, it did. And the first thing I did when I saw that trailer was text you, Matt, Matt, have you seen this? <laughs> um, you were the first person I thought of and that trailer was amazing. Yeah. I've watched it so many times. I can't wait. Oh my God. I can't wait. Really? 
and, and I, I, he's a good actor, so I'm not surprised. But I, I like I gotta admit, I've been sitting here since we found out the casting, wondering mm-hmm. how Elio is it Charmele, uh, Charlemagne, however you pronounce his last name, how he's going to look in the film. Um, I only know him from um, movies like Call Me by Your Name. I've never seen him in more of a sci-fi thing, but he looks incredible. Yeah, I mean, he looks the part of of the character, definitely. I mean, I've, I've read the first Dune book twice. Yeah, um, their whole cat, the casting, I, I'm, I feel really, really good about the casting. You know, not so much Jason Momoa, but hey, you know, they're sandworms. <laughs> <laughs> there are there are good looking sandworms i'm so glad you're still was, holding a grudge against momoa for conan i just no i i, I don't have anything like against momoa it's just you know i'm just like really skeptical that he can pull off this character but it, you know i guess if they want to make him a you know a bro that kicks ass i guess i'll just uh there's a lot of other wonderful things about the movie i'm looking forward to so i can i can put up with that one um uh, the other, uh, not Jason Momoa, but there, there's another actor uh, from superhero movies uh, in this that I'm curious to see. Drax, uh, the guy who plays Drax is in this as well, and looked weird. Like there was something different about him in the trailer. Like, I don't know <laughs> yeah, what it was. He's pale as all get out. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe he, was, he wasn't green, so now I just expect, um, oh, what is that well, guy's name? Dave Batista. Batista, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, no, he literally, I mean, yeah, he looks pale, really pale. And mm-hmm. that's not the way he looks in real life, let alone Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, yeah, he looks – the whole – the the set from what we've seen, the background, the character design. Character design looks so good. Oh, man, it looks good. The Benny Gesserit look amazing. Everything looks really good. I mean, then, of course, going into this, this director um, – Denis Velavenu, or however you say his name, you know, he, he's done everything he's done has looked amazing. As far as anything I've ever seen him do, the, he does killer cinematography. So I went into this expecting this to, to be knocked out of the park as far as visually. I couldn't think of a director that I would want to do this movie more right now. This guy seems like he is perfect for this. Uh, based on the trailer, I can't disagree with you. It's got me excited. It's got me real excited. Hopefully, I'm just uh, excited that Matt's so excited about it. I know. I listen to Man. the sound of his voice. You can it's palpable. It's like what's right? you know, I have that I have that that thing where you're like anticipating something so much, you're like, what's gonna go wrong? Feeling. Yeah, it's called twenty twenty. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it was essentially my thought process when I lost my virginity. <laughs> it's like, I'm really excited, but something's going to go wrong. Um, oh man. <laughs> I think we all know that feeling on some level. Well, what about comics guys? So what have, have y'all read anything this week that really uh, knocked it out of the park for you? I honestly didn't have a chance to read much. So I'll let you guys talk during this segment. <laughs> I was, I mean, nothing really knocked it out of the park for me. I mean, I'm, I didn't pick up anything new except our book of the week as far as, a, you know, a new a number one. I didn't start anything new. I had a very light week. So, yeah. Um, sorry, my answer to your question, Caleb, is not exactly thrilling. Oh, no, that's okay. I mean, that's, that's why I framed it like I did because, you know, right now we're, that's happening more than it's not which is one of the reasons we don't have like the scheduled short stack that we usually do. That's why it's optional, which is, it's nice um, because you don't have to, you know, you don't have to whack something that's not doing it for you. Um, I picked up one. I didn't pick up. I should rephrase that. I received one book this week. I um, actually got it last week that uh, I think is worth noting. I finally got to sit down and flip through it and read it a little bit, but it didn't come from a comic shop. Um, it came in the mail um, <laughs> It came in the mail twice, actually. That's a funny story that I, uh, you know, I'll <laughs> let the person who sent me this book giggle at. Um, but the book is called The Gay Agenda, A Modern Queer History and Handbook. And it was sent to me by our friend and friend of the show and listener. And, you know, because nepotism family, um, Chris Isham, our, our dear buddy up there uh, in Northwest Arkansas, who 
like I said, regular listener to the show. You see him on the Facebook group all the time. But he saw this, and I forget where he said he saw it, but he thought, oh, I should send this to Caleb. And it's really cool. It's a, it's a comic, but not in the uh, classic sense. There's not any sequentials, but there is a lot of comic art, um, a lot of pinups, a lot of um, really, really neatly drawn um, homages to some famous figures in history. The book's put together by Ashley Melesso and um, Chess Need Needham. And it really is. It's a, it's a graphic, uh, almost encyclopedic history of, of the gay rights movement and just gay history in general. And so I really appreciate this. Um, I appreciate it a lot. I now have two copies um, because we, Chris sent it and then didn't hear from me. So he assumed that it got lost in the mail and actually it did get lost in the mail. And so because he's a kind man, he went on Amazon and had it shipped to me via Amazon. Um, but so, but after that happened, it did land on my doorstep the first from the first time he sent it. Um, I'm <laughs> going to be donating that to a local LGBT day center. Um, here in Little Rock called Lucy's Place. Um, since I have two copies, I'm going to send it someplace where other folks can get some enjoyment out of it. Um, so not only did he donate to me, he donated to a little nonprofit here in Little Rock. Um, and that's really appreciative. Um, I, you know, love Chris to death. Uh, he is a, I know, I know he's, he's Craig's cousin, but he's, he's become a dear friend and I thank the world of him. Um, and so, you know, just send a lot of love out to him and his family. That's enough with the Chris praise. No, I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> Craig's like, he's not even the good cousin. No, he is the good cousin. <laughs> he is absolutely the good cousin. Um, but I just thought it was cool, and I wanted to give him a shout out and tell him thank you for sending sending this to me. So Awesome. It's good stuff, man. Um, well, all yeah. right. Well, Matt, Matt mentioned it earlier. We do have a roundtable this week. Uh, what that means is, is that we all – we all bought the same book. We picked it up. We read it. Um, these things differ from week to week, right? Like sometimes <laughs> it's stuff that we have a deep history with. Sometimes it's stuff that we have never heard of before. Sometimes it's, you know, from the big two. Sometimes it's from some little bitty publisher. Nobody's ever heard before. Um, this week, it's a mixture of, of those things. It is from one of the big two, but it's largely something none of us have a lot of history with. Um, and that book is none other than The Rise of Ultraman from Marvel Comics. Um, written, all of it was written by Kyle Higgins and Matt Grom. The main story was drawn by Francesco Mana, uh, colors by Espen Grutenhern. Uh, there's a little story called Things to Come, which was actually uh, written by, uh, drawn by Ed McGinnis and Espen uh, Grutenhern. Uh, a little backstory called Ultra Q, uh, drawn by Michael Cho. And really cool little cutesy um, really comic-y uh, strip-like thing uh, called Kaiju Steps uh, was drawn by Guri Huru. Um, all of it lettered by VC's Adriana Marr um, with a nice little cover by Alex Ross. Uh, before we dive into the, as, as I like to say, and as Matt likes to reiterate that I like to say, the meat and potatoes of the book, uh, what did you guys think about this? How did it treat you? Craig? Uh <laughs> So this book, I, I didn't find any like really fault to the book. I feel like this book would have served uh, um, somebody that's into the Japanese anime manga culture a bit better than me. I thought the art was absolutely beautiful in the book, especially the first few pages. Um, the colors were astounding. Uh, it, yeah, um, didn't really hook me, but it's not a bad book. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll piggyback that. It, it, there's nothing, as far as the delivery goes, the story was told adequately or well, and the art was done really well. It just it, when I put the book down, um, I had no, there was no hook for me to continue to read on. So I was like, well, this must have been written for people that were Ultraman fans already and already have an appreciation and history for whatever Ultraman is, because I don't know anything at all about Ultraman. I didn't either, but let's put a pin in that and we'll come back to it after we talk about it. Cause I had to go do some homework, uh, go do some research right. to, to look at that too. Um, Cause kind of the same. Um, I, I felt like this was a fun book. I, like I said, I, there's not any really nitpicky things. The, the introduction was, was well delivered to these particular uh, individualized characters. Um, it's not a, 
it is not a segment of fiction that I have a lot of history with. And I imagine if you, you know, kind of like Matt said, if you have that history, then you really probably dug this story or dug it as a setup. Um, taking that away, I feel like it was a fine setup book. I, I, you know, it's, it's not a book that I'm going to go run outside and, you know, run down the street and drop a copy on every doorstep or anything, but it was fun. It, it was a cool introduction to this particular world. And I have to imagine in some sense, it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of a reimagining of the Ultraman franchise, especially after I like did some Google sleuthing. Um, I think we're, we're starting from scratch with the characters, but we're not starting from scratch with the concept, if, if that makes any sense. So yeah. the, the book picks up in, it starts in 1966, which is a, which it's, it's an important date for um, folks who are Ultraman fans, because that's actually when the original television show started. Um, that's, that's when this, this whole idea picked up was in 1966 and you've got a pilot and the pilot's piloting this little, you know, high tech air, airplane. And it doesn't say it, but what you need to know about this pilot is he is a member of the science force, which is like this elite Japanese, um, almost like Homeland security, but with more science, uh, team. And all of a sudden his ship just gets like nailed by I don't know what it is. Is it a meteor? Is it a, a comet? Is it something otherworldly? Who, who can say? But it, it doesn't work out well, um, really, for our pilot. Uh, he, you know, it ruins his, it, it destroys the spaceship. He's getting thrown. But as he's, like, falling, the, the meteor, whatever hit his plane, just kind of brightens up. And it starts to kind of suck him into it. And through a very staticky image, through a very... Uh, you know, it's, it's obfuscated by, by lines and scratches. You're, you know, almost a visual interpretation of radio static. You see a face and it's a very robotic like face. And then the story jumps to, to now, um, to 2020. And a, a young girl is, you know, she's catching an Uber cause she's late for work and she doesn't have a car and she's just got to go. She's checking her cell phone. Somebody has been texting her. It's like, Hey, can we finally meet up tonight? Like I miss you. I want to see you. And and she wants to say yes, but you know, she's, she's busy. Like work is, work is going insane for her. Um, and so she's waffling in the back of her head. Inevitably she has to text this person um, that, you know, look, today's not a good day. Um, can we try again next week? Uh, you know, this new job is, is kind of kicking my ass right now. Well, you might be asking and you should be asking, what is this new job? Like who, what, where is this person working at? Well, this person works at the United Science Patrol, the same organization that our pilot from 1966 worked for. Um, and like I said, it's, it's this kind of secret organization. It's a mix between the CIA and Homeland Security for Japan. And I mean, it's just, they, they are really, really in depth with what they do, um, but they are basically geared around science and science exploration. Um, and she's kind of a young cadet. She's, she's starting this new job and she's, she's been working there. Um, and she's, she aspires to better things, right? Like she doesn't want to stay low level. They've got her working on these guns. Uh, you know, these, these little things that they won't really tell her how they work. She just needs to know the mechanics of it. Um, but these are these things, you know, she, she is starting to get a better bead on, on how they work and they're called K rays. They're, they're almost in, she, she's a pretty smart person, but she, she can't figure out the science behind them, but they're keeping it very, very hush hush. They just let her know the, the mechanics of really the, the trigger mechanism, because that's just like a, a gun. And her task is really to make sure that these things are, you know, tip top shape and they're going to function in the field, but she's taken upon herself to kind of figure it out so to speak. And, you know, as she's going to her superiors and she's like, Hey, I need to talk to you about these things. They're like, no, no, you really don't. You just need to make sure they work. Uh, you know, trust the process, trust the chain of command. If you have questions, why aren't, you know, don't come directly to the director, go to the people who are above you um, and, and figure it out from there. Uh, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta follow through with the way things work in these organizations or everything falls apart. Um, and she doesn't like that answer, right? Like she's, she's a smart person. She, she aspires to better things. She wants to be, uh, she wants to be in a higher position and she's a scientist. She yearns 
to know the mechanics of things, to know the makeup of things. She doesn't like um, being tasked with working on equipment or machinery that she doesn't know the inner workings of. And that's just who she is because, hey, and I I think I don't, I didn't mention her name at first. Her name is Kiki. Um, And, you know, that's, like I said, she's young, she's entrepreneurial, and she, she knows that she can be more than what she, what she is if she's just given her chance. Um, Now, when I say just being given a chance, that's the part of the book where the lights dim down and you hear that dumb, dumb, dumb sound. Uh, because <laughs> lo and behold, uh, because plot, <laughs> she is about to get her chance. Um, alarms start going off everywhere in the base. There's lots of whoop whoop sounds. I mean, shit is hitting the fan somewhere. And her her boss, um, his name is Captain Mir- Miratatsu, uh, Muramatsu, excuse me. Um, he comes running in the room and he's just like, hey, hey, Kiki, like, get on my six. We're going out in the field. I need you. Um, my K Ray has been, been busted up. I need you to fix it on the fly. We got to go. Uh, and she's just like, what, what the heck's going on? Like what, what, what's happening? He's like, don't worry about it. Just follow me. We're going in the field. And they do, they get out there and, and where they go is a little, maybe not what you would expect. They roll into a meat plant into a, like an industrialized butcher shop and they open the door and there's all these hog bodies, you know, they've been cut in the half. They're hanging on hooks. Um, you know, looks like it might be the introduction to Blade, <laughs> if you remember that. And so as they're looking around, you know, he's like, hey, tell me what you see. And as she starts to focus on these things, everything looks a little distorted, looks a little warped. And so she starts telling him, it's like, hey, like nothing in here looks like, looks right. Those, the the meat is bleeding and that's not how butchery works. Like these things should already be bled out and the meat hooks are way bigger than they should be. And he's like, all right, good job. Like you, you picked up on those little things because what happens and what is happening here is a Kaiju has like come through the void. And when the Kaiju come through the void, everything gets a little distorted. Now, if you're somebody who doesn't know what a Kaiju is, maybe that word is, is not in your vocabulary. Um, A Kaiju is Godzilla right? A kaiju is Mothra. They're these big monster-esque, larger than life, usually insectoid and or um, lizard-like creatures who are from a different plane, a different dimension than ours. And they come through and they wreak havoc. They're, they're, they're treated like bad guys in a lot of fiction, but they're not necessarily bad guys. Like they're just kind of acting on natural instinct. Um, sometimes that works in our favor, a la Godzilla. Sometimes it doesn't work in our favor a la you know lord godira um but in this case it's one of those things that's maybe not working in our favor because as they shine their flashlights around giant lizard-esque monster type creature uh, rears its ugly head and goes after them um and completely just takes its little claw and and rips through kiki's boss's arm i mean just fucks him up takes him out of the game and it's his it's his you know it's a gun hand too. So that's really going to be an issue. So it's K Ray that Kiki just worked really hard in fixing falls to floor, but she is not without her own little weapon. She pulls out her, it's little linky dink, uh, lightning gun and she pops it. And really it doesn't do anything but piss this thing off. And it looks bad. Like it looks bad for our dynamic duo right here. Right. Um, but all of a sudden, you know, laser from the side hits and knocks this creature on its ass and she looks around and she sees her buddy shin who is shin where did this dude come from well shin turns out to be who she was texting with from the very beginning um they're friends there may be a little more there it seems like there's a seed of something there don't really get into it but shin also wants to be part of the science division you know he, he wants to be part of this lead organization in fact he tested for it but he flunked whatever the test was and he doesn't get to take the the, the next test for an entire decade, like 2023 is, or no, not because this is not 2003. Um, (laughs) He doesn't get to take it for another two years, um, two or three years. He doesn't get to take it till 2023. And that's a problem. Like he's watching his friend rise in the ranks and do whatever he wants to do um, and get a, get to be this awesome, like secret agent that he, that he knows he, he needs to be a part of because he's seen the kaiju. He, he's seen behind the veil. It's not something that he can unsee. Uh, and, and he wants to be part of this team, but they, they won't let him. Um, and so after they drop this kaiju, they do what they need to do to get it taken care of. You know, uh, he and Kiki go out and they're kind of 
hashing things out as friends. You know, she's been ignoring him. Um, he's, he's a little bit jealous of her and taking that out against her in kind of a begrudging fashion, but he is, he's proud of her. He's, he's happy for her. And so they have a little tiff as friends and they get over it, you know, over some nice, probably tea and some dinner. Um, and, and as she's, as they get past it, they get to a little bit better place where they can actually have a conversation. Um, and they, you know, she's explained like, Hey, I'm not going to feel guilty for my achievements, but I can still do like, I can still want it for you as well. Those things aren't anathema to each other, right? Those things can, can coexist. So you need to calm down and quit being a bitch (laughs) is essentially what she says to him. Um, and so as they talk things out, she's like, look, I can't help but feel as I get deeper and deeper in this, like there's things that they aren't telling us. There's something else that they're keeping hidden from even me, somebody who's inside the organization. And yeah, this is a secret organization, but I'm part of the team now. Like, why are they hiding this stuff from us? And about that time, somewhere far, far away, uh, uh, something that looks a lot like a comet, wink, wink, nod, nod, enters the atmosphere and streaks down towards earth. Uh, But the science division being almost a safety net around the world, um, They've got the big guns, literally the big guns <laughs> hidden. And so, you know, all of a sudden this gigantic, I don't know if it's a plasma cannon or what, but it rips out of a, essentially a barn and just starts blasting this thing, um, shoots it to the ground. All the, like I said, all this is happening while, while our, our dynamic duo is enjoying dinner. So they're going home, right? Like, like she, she's getting dropped off and all of a sudden her phone goes off and they're still together. Um, and again, he's not part of the science division. So, you know, what she should do is just be like, hey, I got to get out and go. You can't be a part of this. But that's not what she does because they're friends, right? So she's like, hey, whip the car around. Let's go check this out. Um, and so they go meet Kiki's boss, who by this time has got his arm in a sling. You know, he got he got punched by a monster, um, not feeling so great. And they meet him at this crash site. There's a big crater in the ground, um, hot and glowy. It's, it's looking weird. Um, and, the, you know, as they get there, her boss is like, Hey, you know, this is, this is code Emerald. And she's like, I don't know what the fuck that means. Like, what, what, what do you mean code Emerald? And he's like, no, dude, UFO. Did you not study the manual? Um, and of course, uh, you know, our, our boy over here, hears this and he's freaking out. He's like UFO, are we about to make first contact? Like, what is this? And the guy just looks at him like first contact. Nah, son, we've been here before. The last time this happened was 1966. Um, and it killed one of the best men I know. Uh, and so this is, you know, a little throwback to the beginning of the story and a throwback to the Ultraman origin. Um, and so their job, the reason they show, show up here is to make sure that this thing is dead because, you know, the giant gun shot it down. And so as they get a little bit too close to it, something starts happening. Something starts to break out of it. Um, and it's an ultra, it's what we know as ultra, uh, but they don't know that they don't know what this is. Um, and so they pull their guns, they start blasting this thing. Um, and as they shoot it, they can tell it hurts it. It, it, it drops it to its knees. It's a, it's a humanoid looking thing. Um, but there's something about its eyes that makes Kiki realize that, Hey, look like we're hurting this thing. It's not what it like. This isn't what this thing wants. Like it's, it's very expressive. Um, and, and Shin kind of starts realizing this at the same time. So he starts walking up to it. Um, as the ultra gets up and like, like I said, this thing is huge. This thing is like multiple stories tall and it dropped to its knees. Um, Shen reaches out at the same time the ultra does and they, they touch fingers. It's really, really kind of a cutesy little concept. Um, they touch the tips, if you will. Uh, and, and all of a sudden lights shine out and <laughs> it, it, this light just bathes over Shen and what you know is he kind of absorbs it and that's where we get the the to be continued um what's going to happen well shin is now paired up with an ultra he's going to be the new ultraman uh we know that uh just well i maybe we don't know that if you're new to the story you might not know that um but that's the general concept um and because this is a, a cool part of the book and it's a big book for the price point you get those other stories that i mentioned like ultra q um which is drawn by michael cho which is actually my favorite part of the book it was very um very much a throwback noir spy story set in the, in the Ultraman universe and those Kaiju steps books, which were, like I said, kind of younger esque uh, drawn more in a strip style um, meant for a younger style, which again, just, just as cool. Um, but not so much uh, didn't, didn't strike me for my particular tastes as much as the, the ultra Q story did. Um, 
I thought this was fun. I had a really good time with it. Um, but like you said, we are not, uh, we are not well-versed in the, the Ultraman history. This is one of those times I was texting, texting y'all this morning. I miss, uh, our former co-host Jerry, um, because he like knows this stuff. It, it is, it is part of his wheelhouse. It's part of his fandom. And, you know, I, this, I wish he was here this morning because he could just wax poetic about it. Um, but before I, I drop some history, uh, some of some of my Google knowledge on y'all, um, anything, <laughs> anything that I missed, anything that, that I didn't cover that y'all, y'all saw that was worth noting? No, I mean, I felt like the human aspect of this uh, had a very men in black feel. Yeah. Uh, without probably the comedy that you get, but they had kind of the nebulizer type thing where they could erase people's memories. And, you know, then you have the aliens and you have the alien tech guns and things of that nature. So, you know, it kind of has that vibe. Uh, you know, and again, it's just, it was really beautiful to me. The artwork in the main story was just absolutely beautiful. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's probably, it feels a lot like Men in Black because I am, I am guessing that you can probably trace the roots of Men in Black back um, to this, honestly. Um, there's a lot of our late 20th century sci-fi um, that I, I think it might have not been conceptualized with Ultraman, but the roots at least go back through it. Uh, like I said, the, the first Ultraman story was written in 1966. So this, this, this was created, this, this hero, heroic, heroic uh, template, if you will, was created at the same time that like the Avengers and the Fantastic Four were being created um, over in the States. Uh, you know, when Marvel was, was hitting its cosmic stride, Black Panther, Ultraman's roots go just as far back in time um, to the same kind of conception in Japan. This was the first, um, the first of its kind to kind of, sh to kind of show off this hero and things like Super Sentai were born out of this. Power Rangers were were born out of this. Uh, you know, stuff from my childhood that really have a beloved fan base now. All of that ha can be traced directly back to Ultraman um, as far as a concept, and I think that's neat especially from us because these things are just as old and just as storied as some of our favorite heroes um, from the mid, the mid 20th century. And yet they're, they're still new to us, but I, so much of the pop culture that we enjoy, I think stems from this era, um, this, this era of Japanese film, because that's actually where it starts from. Uh, because I'm me, <laughs> I got on the, the internets this morning and like, I found some cool like YouTube videos where some people who were, really well versed in this uh, spoke out about it and kind of gave you some of the history, but, but really spoke about where this was conceptualized. And it's interesting, especially because of the Kaiju aspect, it really was made just so this one Japanese film company, um, well, not just because, but in, in a large part, because this Japanese film company wanted to be able to make money off of the props that they used in the Godzilla movies. And so if you go back and you watch some of these old episodes, they're actually like repurposing the original Godzilla suit. Like uh, Ultraman is fighting, you know, they put a, a giant net around Godzilla head and like painted a different color, but it's still Godzilla. Um, and so you can see where <laughs> that, was, that was born from. Um, and it was really the, uh, you know, there's a lot of our Western movies that, that take these monster themes and adapt it from the use of like, you know, live props, uh, you, you know, the, the big iconic images that we can think of derive from Ultraman and Godzilla and these, this genre of, of film uh, or, or of television film really that of, of the 1960s Japan, it's where it comes from. Um, and they, they started it and you, you know, other people, depending on what your access to it is, you know, or how much you've been immersed in it, you may have opinions on who did it better. That's debatable. That's fine. That's, that's cool. Um, but this is where it comes from. And I think that is incredibly cool. And to know that, that things like the, the power Rangers and even like you said, men in black um, were borrowed from this to me, I was sitting here thinking it has kind of a really cool, like Nick Fury agents of shield 
aspect of it, especially when I was reading the Ultra Q, because it, it's written as kind of that era. It's 1960s spy. Um, Michael Cho has got very much a Darwin. He's in the same school as Darwin Cook. I, you know, I, I imagine he studies him as as all people who want that style should. But it felt like that. And it's it's neat to me that both of like both Agents of Shield and Ultraman and the science the science unit or, or what did they call it were being conceptualized in New York and in Japan uh, at the same time by folks like Jack Kirby and the creators of Ultraman. Like they put all this together um, and partially because, you know, we're, we're t- what 20 years post uh, world war two at this point. Um, so we're starting to see some of the, the ideas behind these weird government science entities being used in fiction more and more um, same time that, Italy was beginning to really jump into their science fiction phase um, after, you know, getting past the fascism of, of that era for them. All of this stuff was in the, the cultural zeitgeist across the world. And it really did give birth to, you know, it, to all of pop culture, not all of it, to a large part of pop. I'm trying not to, to expand this too far to a large part of the <laughs> pop culture that, that we get to appreciate today. And it's got roots, man. It's got roots that go back to, to the, like the, this thing. Um, I did not know when I was a kid where I was, you know, watching the power Rangers kick all kinds of ass. Number one, they were the power Rangers. They weren't super Sentai. I didn't know what super Sentai were, was. And then you, you trace it back as an adult to get super Sentai all the way back to Ultraman. Um, you know, Mega Man has roots that trace back to this. It's just really, really cool. Um, Ultraman is a, is not a person. Ultraman is an alien of sorts. It, he's an entity that comes from a race of people whose planets were destroyed by these giant kaiju thing. Uh, and inevitably, like, there have been multiple Ultramen Ultramans, Ultramen, I'm not sure what the vernacular is on that, but who have traveled through through time and space at different points to to be where they need to be. This one just happened to land on Earth because it was a conversion point. And so it knew it needed to be here. Um, some really cool elements that work out visually incredibly neat. The, the gem on his chest is basically a battery icon. <laughs> so it lets him know when... Uh, you know, when he needs to quit being Ultraman. The Ultraman is, I don't know if you would consider him a parasite or just something that lives, like cohabitates with a human, but he, he anytime the Ultra shows up, they, they go inside a person. They need a host body. And, you know, it, it maintains it as in two different personalities, but it adapts the, the human's personality, um, sometimes to a fault, sometimes to a benefit. Uh, but it allows them to switch the powers on and off. Um, so what that battery does is lets them know, Hey, like you need to either like finish this fight quick, like quit, quit fucking around or, or you need to like run because you can't win this right now. Um, I thought that was cool. The most of what Ultraman does is, is physical. Um, you know, it deals with martial arts a whole lot, but he does use beams. Like he can shoot out these, I don't know if you want to call them beta rays or what from his hands. Like he does this thing where he crosses his arms and it shoots light beams out. It's, it's, you know, exactly what you can imagine from, you know, early, early, late, well, late nineties, early two thousands power Rangers, when they shoot like these beams of light at the, the monsters, that's exactly where it comes from. Um, there's, there's a really cool history with it. And then Netflix actually just put a new, uh, you can call it anime if you want to. I think it's, it goes way past what we think of as anime. It's very computer um, computer driven. Gorgeous. It looks, man, it looks stunning. Um, and it's a new take on it, on Ultraman. Um, similar to this, you know, the old Ultraman has been defeated um, or the, and they didn't necessarily need him anymore. Uh, and so as the science unit deals with the world, all of a sudden a new Ultra emerges and you know there's there's more than one so um it really plays on the fact that this is not just ultraman is not a being ultraman is almost a race of being um that spread around if you haven't seen the netflix series go watch it because it's fun it's really fun and that was a whole lot of uh ultraman backstory there (laughs) youtube will say good good job (laughs) yeah i uh you know i 
don't know that I've ever seen any Ultraman ever, other than some, you know, gifs or gifs or however you want to say it floating around. Um, you know, again, the I, I feel like there's a market for this story, for this book, and I feel like those people are absolutely going to love this book because it actually is well written, it's well put together. I just don't think I'm the market for that book. Well, but you're not like a big like when I think of of you and I've known you for a few years now, you're not somebody who really digs like Power Rangers, and I don't think you're necessarily obsessed or, or obsessive about monster movies either. Um, I don't think I've no. ever, you know, other than the occasional dip into Godzilla, I don't think you're yeah. a, you know, a real big kaiju fan, have you? No, I'm I'm really not. When I was a kid, I watched some uh, Godzilla growing up, but everybody of my generation did, you know. Right. You. You watched uh, a lot of the Japanese monster movies just because it, you know, you had three channels. If it was on, you watched it. Uh, but that being said, I enjoyed them. It's just, it, you know, it, it's it's okay. Like I said, this is for somebody, just not me. It's neat that it's at. Um, it's neat that it's at Marvel. Um because it is bringing some of that, like I said, it was, it was invented at the same era. And I don't know how or when Marvel got the rights to this character, but it's cool to think that they're going to bring, bring him over to that house. Now I don't, I'm of two minds. I don't necessarily want to see Ultraman as a Marvel hero. Um, I don't, I don't need to see Ultraman fighting like the silver surfer, but maybe, I mean, I said the same thing about, Conan too, but I enjoyed to a point, not, you know, not overly, I enjoyed like the, the savage Avengers where Conan was a part of the Avengers team. So I, I think it's, I think there's neat potential there. I don't know. Um, I don't, I haven't decided yet for me, which it's, you know, ultimately it's not up to me. It's up to the writers. I just don't know if that would be a good idea or just an idea. It would definitely be an idea. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know either um, how I would feel about that. So I'm, I'm in very much the same opinion as you. Maybe keep it its own thing. Generally, how do you guys feel about that? Like, as, as Marvel or DC adopt these other properties, um, do, do you guys want to see them, like, brought in and merged with those larger universes? You know, I think it depends on the property. Yeah. You know, they brought in Angela from Spawn and brought her into the Asgardian deal. At first, I was a little resistant to it, but overall, it, it doesn't bother me that she's a character in the Marvel Universe. I, I just think it depends on on the character. Yeah. I don't think there's an overall right or wrong answer to that. Is there any other examples you can think where it's done been done well or even adequately? Uh, yeah, well, exactly. So the, well, the Wildstorm stuff being brought over to DC, like making Midnighter and Apollo part of the DC universe, I think that was done well. Um, you know, there's been stories that have been better than others. That's, But, I mean, those are superheroes, like cut from the same cloth. Almost, yeah. you could argue that they're derivative. I mean, they are derivative, like – they were supposed to be the the Justice League, but harder. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the that's the thing. I mean, so I didn't read. You know, after the Wildstorm universe was brought into the DC universe, why did the Justice League not immediately try to put them down as uh, villains? Basically, that uh, well because. The writers. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> because plot. Exactly. I, I think yeah, exactly. When they there were, you go. I think when they were brought over, um, it had to have been post one of the crisis events, I'm assuming. Um, well, I mean, that everything's history, post a crisis event. Right. I mean, that's yeah. just decent. So <laughs> I think it would have had to have like been the, the continuity of the, the Wildstorm era. Like, the, it was a new version of those characters. So, the the things that they had done, you know, arguably the murder um, <laughs> had not. Yeah, see, been. see what you're trying, what you're dancing around is the fact that Superman and the Wildstorm team 
the universe cannot coexist unless it's, it's unless it's shoehorned and forced. Next week in Marvel, we're bringing in Homelander. I don't. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just <laughs> it's very. I've never seen it done. I can't think of any instance where it's done well or adequately. It's it's always felt forced to me, and it's always been just. It feels like a blatant corporate move every time. It doesn't feel like a creative move at all whatsoever. It feels like a corporate move, and it's just like yeah. I can't think of any exception to that. Like I said, the closest I could come was the Wildstorm stuff. Um, I think what you're saying is, is exactly what it felt like when they were trying to do the the Watchmen characters more recently at DC. Oh, absolutely. Uh, that, that's exactly like that was my thoughts behind it whatsoever. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 weird. Um, and 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 Conan doesn't really count because Conan started at Marvel, right? That was that was always Roy Thomas's baby. Um, and well, so it, it, more I, just so I think it totally home. counts because Conan started at Marvel, sure, but he also he always existed within his own universe. I mean, he had his own universe within the Marvel universe. Right. He wasn't part of the continuity. So, and yeah, and that's a great example. Bringing Conan into the, I'm just like, oh, and I, you know, Conan's one of my favorite characters ever. But I'm not going to mm-hmm. read a story where he's, you know, interacting with Wolverine. You know, if you, I mean, it's it's just oh, you know you enjoyed the. The Conan, the Conan uh, Punisher stuff. Yeah, I see. No, I hated it actually. <laughs> From <Saturday. laughs> very good point. But popped that series as soon as that happened. Yeah, I hated it. it. You know, it just it feels like a corporate move. It, there's no artistic justification to that. It's like, gosh, ugh, it feels gross. So I don't have such an extreme response to it, but it it is it is difficult and and like you said there is no at least to my mind there's not a lot of examples of when it's been done well where it didn't feel that way um so i I, yeah like i said that's and then part of that's why i don't want to see ultraman since ultraman is at marvel now where i don't need to see them try to merge it even though there is some connective tissue there like there there are ways that they could um but i just let it let it be its own thing it's it's marvel's big enough for multiple universes we we know that so i'm kind of like yeah just let this be what it is um yeah which is exactly why they won't do it that's my opinion (laughs) it's why they will do it or won't do it but will not do it that's why they will not keep it its own separate thing we're going to have an ultraman versus iron man comic any day now (laughs) (laughs) it's it's probably already been pitched i want to see yeah well I don't know. It depends on who's drawing it, but Ultraman fighting Galactus sounds fun. <laughs> so, or Fin Fang. Galactus Fang. is dead. His oh. helmet is a bridge on Asgard. Galactus is like Cobra Kai. It never dies. <laughs> <laughs> so are, are, do you guys think, I don't know that I'm going to keep reading this just cause like I said, I'm not a, it, it, it was fine. It was good. Um, I may, if they keep pumping out the ultra Q story in the back, just cause I'm a sucker for like, that style of art, like Michael Cho's art, do you guys think that you're going to continue on with this? I won't, but I figure a good portion of our uh, listeners will mm-hmm. be interested in this. I mean, again, if you like manga, if you like anime, if you like Godzilla, Power Rangers, or Power Rangers, any of those sorts of things, this is definitely a book you should pick up and, and read. I got nothing. I kind of want to go back and dig up some of the, the Harvey comics. So that's where Ultraman in comic form first hit the West was, was the Harvey books. Kind of want to maybe go try to find some of those. If we ever get to go back to like conventions and back issue diving. So it'll happen one day. I have faith. That's what they tell us. That will. (laughs) That's that's what they keep saying. Um, So fingers crossed. I miss cons real bad. I miss life. Also that. You know what else I miss? I miss What's Matt. That? I miss Matt telling us about what he read this week. Well, wait no longer. Ooh. So this is a series that I've mentioned throughout the years, and uh, I've never really talked about it on the show before. I think this was my first read of uh, work by Ed Brisson. Uh, this is the Bullseye miniseries that he did as part of the running with the devil imprint, uh, a daredevil imprint 
this was this uh, issue number one came out in April 2017. Uh, the artist was Guillermo Santa. The colorist is Miroslav Mirva. Uh, then there's a second story in the back, just a one-off story in the back of issue number one. Uh, the writer was uh, the great Marv Wolfman. Uh, the artist was Alec Morgan. And the colorist is Frank Martin. The this is a just a one-off story. It feels like an episode in Bullseye's life, basically. And it's about him doing some hits for hire. Um, he's doing them out of boredom, not because he needs the money. He has a contact that sets up these hits for him, and he asks him for difficult jobs. He doesn't want an easy job. So the story starts off where he, it opens up where he is killing an a, a, um, FBI, excuse me, he's killing a mob accountant turned FBI informant. The guy's in seclusion, getting ready for trial. Bullseye shows up, kills a bunch of FBI agents, of which there are only about four uh, serving as protection. And kills the FBI informant. And uh, the next scene is Bullseye is in the office of his contact asking him for another job. The contact is going through some options. Bullseye keeps turning them down for being too boring. So he finally settles on one of a local drug dealer looking for a hitman because the drug dealer's son has been taken hostage by a drug supplier in Central America. The drug supplier is trying to cut out the middleman and go from being a supplier to the actual dealer in the States. You know, so they, he needs his boy rescued. Bullseye's response is obviously, I'm not a babysitter. What do you I mean? Why, why would you give me a rescue mission? I'm, that's not what I do, <laughs> uh, which is very valid. <laughs> so the, the contact says, the contact, contact says, well, this, this, this job's going to be very messy, and that's what you're looking for. So just go meet with him and hear him out. While he's having this meeting in his contact's office, he picks up a box of paper clips, and while they're having a conversation, Bullseye opens a window and starts throwing paper clips out the window. First thing he does is he causes a car accident by shooting these paper clips through a car window and killing the driver. Uh, then, as the police show up, he takes another paper clip, tosses it, kills the responding police officer. Then he uh, causes the responding ambulance to wreck with another one of these paper clips. And he's doing this as they're having this conversation. He's just going through paper clips, causing explosions, car wrecks, and homicides from the window. Nobody being the wiser to why this is street. Uh, and he only stops when he runs out of paper clips. So he leaves the office. I mean, that makes he, perfect sense. That's when I would stop. Obviously, yeah. I mean, so <laughs> you get a little window into who we're dealing with here. He's doing this for his for his own amusement while he's sitting there having a conversation. But the story goes on. What we find out is there is a female FBI agent whose husband was one of the FBI agents on duty and bullseye killed him. Well, there's footage of bullseye walking into the scene. I mean, he's in his bullseye costume. He does not care if he's captured on video, doesn't care if people find out it's him because he's a psychopath. So she vows to hunt him down. So we have that, you know, so that set in motion in, the, in issue number one. Well, so Bullseye goes and meets with this drug dealer who actually he knew in the past when the guy was a low-level mobster. So they're having a conversation and he's telling Bullseye, you know, why he needs him to go in and rescue his son 
instead of just him, you know, because Bullseye's question is, why don't you just go to war with him like any other gang gang war? And he's like, well, we can't do that because this supplier also supplies other families. So this needs to be a surgical strike, not a, a mass murder strike, not a total war. Because if, we, if I disrupt the entire, entire supply, then I'll have all the, everybody's going to go to war against me. So Ed Brisson does a really good, really good, thorough, but not monotonous job on explaining why this makes sense, why you would have bullseye do this. So, but the, you know, what's funny is the drug dealer is telling him, look, we need discretion. You've got to do this quiet. This has got to be, you know, this has got to be surgical. And bullseye's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just kind of, he's entertaining him as he's talking. And as bullseye goes to leave, this drug dealer reaches out and grabs his arm and says, no, please, I need you to promise me. Think about that. He's asking Bullseye to make him a promise. I mean, it's, it's, you know, of course, in the look on the expression on Bullseye's face is amazing. The way this is. Oh, I'm sure. Asking Bullseye to make you a promise is, I mean, is absolutely absurd. You've you've made bad choices at that point. So this number one issue. Correct. You have no idea who you're dealing with when you ask <laughs> Bullseye to make you a promise. So the issue ends at the airport in Columbia where this drug supplier is uh, located, where their base is located. The issue ends with a scene of people stampeding out of and around the airport as Bullseye is killing people with a staple gun. And the final page is him <laughs> tossing, yeah. The final page is Bullseye in full costume in view of everybody tossing flyers about the place say with his picture on it saying i'm coming for you love bullseye <laughs> so he is not he is not delivering on his de uh, low-key surgical strike already <laughs> i love the things that he finds to kill people with oh yeah yeah and, he, and that's what you know another thing that you notice in here is he's not carrying any weapons with him on any of these jobs he does what right. bullseye, do, bullseye does he finds things and uses anything and everything he can as a killing machine. You know, the, the first hit in the book, he's, he's killing people with forks and knives. He throws a pizza cutter at a guy. He has <laughs> playing cards. Yeah, he, I mean, he is, he is written very, very well in this series. I, I mean, this really made me a fan of Ed Brisson very quickly when I read this did, series. Did you ever read the miniseries? And I don't remember what team was on it at the time, but it, it was in the early 2000s. And it was a like four issue bullseye miniseries. And in one of the issues, before he becomes a criminal, he's a pitcher in baseball. He mm -hmm. gets called up to the major leagues, pitches a perfect game in his first game, and drops his bat and glove and walks off the field and never <laughs> returns. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard of that, but frankly, yeah. I don't feel like I need to read it because everybody's told me about it a million times. Oh, it's, it's amazing, it. though. Yeah. But the second, you know, that, that's worth mentioning in this back, this just this short story that Marv Wolfman uh, wrote is really, really good. Of course, he's one half of the creative team of the character Bullseye. And man, he's still, he still got it. This, this short little story in the back is great. And it feels so Bullseye. I mean, it's, it is so good. Uh, oh, you can get this. This is, what's that? I was going to say, Mar Marv Wolfman, he'll, he'll never lose it. I mean... Like they, it doesn't get much better than Marv Wolfen. So this, you can get this series in trade paperback. You can get it. I mean, you can find the single issues cheap. I mean, this is a dollar book, you know, on eBay all day long, but it is an absolutely blast. It is so fun to read as a villain. I really like a good villain story where they don't, and Deb Brisson doesn't pull any punches. He does not try to make, bullseye redeemable at all whatsoever he's a complete psychopath and he writes him to the nine that's awesome and it's clever too yeah there's some very some very, it's just clever it's well written real structured and clever as well so i it's super fun to read if you have any interest in the character of bullseye and if you don't this if this doesn't make you interested in the character and want to see more of him you're that's the character's just not for you you know, I wonder why I, I passed on this particular story because I usually would pick up bullseye stuff. But yeah, I will definitely be looking for that. 
I just respect that Bullseye looks for entertainment value in his jobs. <laughs> we, we, should all, we should all be more like Bullseye. In that <laughs> he aspect. finds it. <laughs> we, don't, don't take a job unless it he brings you He certainly finds it. If you're, yeah. If you're going to be an assassin, be one that you, you know, enjoy your job. Yeah. And it's, it's just the little things that, you know, the way Brisson writes him, just a little, I think Brisson writes villains and violent characters better than anything else. Anything I've read yeah. by him, if you, if he's writing somebody that is, you know, violent psychopath, it's man, he kills it. That's why I was so hacked off that, um, that his Punisher Barracuda book got, delayed or whatever has happened to it. I was stoked about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hopefully it hasn't been uh, canned. I don't know. I know a lot of the artwork was done for it because, you know, but it's just, it's gone radio silent ever since the COVID-19 impact on Marvel comics. It's just gone radio silent. Yeah. So many things have, so. Hopefully it'll come back because I'm interested in that as well. I mean, and, and that's what's most important is if I am interested in it or not. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Barracuda has been one of my favorite Punisher villains from the get go. Ever since I read him in the, in the Inna stuff, they don't do enough with that character, which might be a good thing. Well, they don't do, I mean, you know, what do they do? With the Punisher, I mean, you know, the Punisher, nobody's really um, done much with the character since Ennis. Well, I shouldn't say Ennis, since uh, Jason Aaron's run. After when he followed Garth Ennis and then Jason Aaron did a run. Yeah. There's not been much done with him. You know, that Matthew Rosenberg series went for about, I don't know, 20 some odd issues. It was okay. It was hit and miss. Uh, frankly, I know it didn't sell well. That's why it went away. Yeah. No, Ro- Rosenberg's a strong writer. He's somebody that if I see his name on a book, I'll probably grab it just to check it out. That that series did not start well from the beginning because they had um, they had an artist plan for it that backed out at the last minute, and then they had to go get an artist that I I genuinely don't think is a good artist. Might be the best dude in the world, but his art is not where it needs to be. Um, and so that like that, I just couldn't couldn't read it because of that. Uh, the the best stuff with me for me in the last couple of years has have, that the Punisher's been in was in us though it was like his his platoon um, series I thought that was really good that play you know piggybacks off of his Punisher Born uh, series I thought that stuff was really well done but it's in us so that's that goes without saying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, I found a book this week that was on the free comic book day stack at the local comic book store so you can and i was super excited about this because if anybody's listened to this show when the hillbilly run was out by eric powell i talked about it frequently well this is a hillbilly free comic book day book called the lizard of rusty creek cave of course it's albatross it's all written drawn colored lettered well there's it's the colors are all just uh, black and grays but it's all done by eric powell what I thought was kind of funny was the usual tagline on the hillbilly book is uh, there are many tales of Rondell, the wandering hillbilly. This was but one. This issue's tagline was there are many tales of Ron, uh, Rondell, the wandering hillbilly, but this one is free, which I thought was kind of funny. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> uh, this book starts in a small Appalachian village where the families are drawing stones to see who will have to sacrifice their preteen daughter to the lizard of Rusty Creek cave. Once the, the victim is determined that girl's best friend is obviously overrun with grief and he calls out the town elders for being cowards and not dealing with this lizard in a proper way. Uh, They ridicule her and she turns away. She runs off into the woods crying. And as she sits in her grief, a wanderer soon approaches one of the heroes from the witch war, uh, James Stone Turner, the wizard. James tells her he would help her, but he's on his way to an important errand and time is of the essence. But he gives her directions to Rondell's house. Uh, Once reaching Rondell, Uh, He reluctantly agrees to help, but says the town must pay him with a dinner and don't go skimpy on the uh, 
spoiled taters either, which is usual his usual payment. He always expects the town to pay him in food. So he goes and gets his gear and he comes out and he's got his witch cleaver hanging over his shoulder, which is, you know, she asks him about the rumors of uh, no evil being able to touch it. And he responds with, the devil don't trust none of the servants, so everything he owns right down to the cutlery in his kitchen he lays a curse upon so that none can use it against him. And as formidable as the devil's cleaver is, he hopes to never see the devil's ladle again, or ladle again. <laughs> I want to hear the story of the devil's ladle. Yes. <laughs> I want to know what the hell about this ladle scares Rondell the wandering hillbilly with his giant devil's cleaver. And also I have questions about how any food actually gets prepared in hell if it's all cursed, <laughs> but another story for another time. Um, I'm not going to tell you how the story ends. I will tell you that Rondell goes and confronts the lizard, uh, but the outcome is probably not what you're going to expect it to be. And the best part of this book in, is that it ends with the promises of more stories set in Rondell's world. This book, you know, it, it's just fun. It's fun, kind of a mythological thing set in the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, you've got this hillbilly with a meat cleaver going around killing evil things and helping people. And this one's just another issue in that. In, in the art... Eric Powell does these loose lines that somehow get all this detail and you don't quite know how he does it with his art style, but you look on this page and it's just absolutely covered with, with beautiful backgrounds and detail uh, done in blacks and grays beautifully every issue. And I'm looking forward to the next uh, series. His stuff really does remind, especially his lines, reminds me so much of Eisner. Yeah, I think that's I think that's intentional. I mean, he, you know, he, oh, one hundred percent, especially the goon stuff is is much more Eisner, I would say. But yeah, he very much is a Eisner type artist. Yeah, just absolutely in that school. Just speaking of yeah. goon, have you have you read much of the goon? I, that is a series I I've tried actually, to get into. I have not, and yeah. I should, but I have not. It's just one of those things, like, I, I've, I've read it and then put it down and never came back to it. Um, and then, you know, so much time passed that I tried to come back to it later, had to reread it all again, and the same thing happened. Um, yeah. And I don't know why, because I genuinely, like, love the look of his stuff. Um, there yeah. Was a, there was a mini series that came out, shit, probably 10 years ago called Big Man Plans that Powell did. That yeah. actually, if I still have, oh, yeah. it, have you read this, Matt? I picked up the first couple, two, three issues. Well, it was a four issue series. So, you know, if you only got the first three, go get, like, I'll try to see if we can't hunt down that fourth issue for you. But it was, it was hilarious. And it like, he's got such a, he's got such a sense of humor, but it, it, it border. Well, I think what makes it perfect is he's, he's borderlining the quote unquote offensive, but he always just steps right up to it. And he knows that balance of when not. So with, with big man plans, it's about this little person, somebody who is, you know, quote unquote little person um, who they use in Vietnam to go into the holes and dig out the things. And he makes some jokes that you gotcha. know, could be, could be offensive, could be politically incorrect, but he's he's so measured in the way he does it that he steps right back from it, and it's it's almost just perfect. The timing is perfect, and and that's the kind of stuff you get with Eric Powell. Like he's just so measured in his uh, in his writing that like he's got such a control over it that I can only be enviable of it. It's just well, in one thing in the Hillbilly series is that to me he absolutely nails the dialect well of mountain people. Mm -hmm. you know which isn't always an easy thing to do you know you, you can tell when somebody studied a little bit to me he nails it pretty well and it's yeah. not over the top you know it doesn't sound like the that group of people that live in alaska and have the television show <laughs> you know it sounds <laughs> it sounds like more southern mountain people 
Right. Well, isn't that Eric Powell? Isn't that his his uh, background? Very well, maybe. I'm not sure where he's from, to be honest with you. But it, if it is, it certainly shows. Because he he absolutely does it well, and I and I love that you have this, uh, you know, this guy that's fighting evil with, you know, this giant meat cleaver. And he's just a hillbilly living in the Appalachian Mountains, killing witches and demons and lizards, dragons, whatever he needs to take care of. Like if it's evil, he'll do it for, you know, for for a steak and some boiled taters. Just don't go light on them. <laughs> like a boss. <laughs> well, all right. Well, I, gonna... I really want to know this, the story of the other devil's equipment though i wonder if the devil has a strainer the devil's strainer that's where <laughs> the hostetarians came from oh, yes <laughs> <laughs> that that ne- okay we just made his next arc he can send us a check. Uh, there you go so well i'm going to take us back to marvel land for a little bit if if i can um and i'm not going to talk about a single issue as much as a collective uh, of issues that tell a story that just wrapped up uh, this past week. Um, and that is, it, you know, it, it's kind of been Marvel's summer event that we really haven't spoken about much on the show, but that's Avengers and Fantastic Four's Empire, um, which is the six issue. Like I said, it's a, it's been the summer event written by Al Ewing and Dan Slott. Um, wonderfully, wonderfully drawn by Valerio Shidi and colored by Marte Gracia. Um, I I enjoyed this a lot. Like it was a, it was fast paced. It was intricate. It was a lot of fun. Um, you guys know, I am a big fan of the young Avengers um, for multiple reasons. Uh, you know, there, there's the aspect of the fact that Wiccan and Hulkling are a lot of representation, but also the young Avengers are fun. They're one of the, the newer kind of like the runaways. They're geared towards younger folks that, that, really took off same reason I like the champions um, very similar in, in tone to that. Um, but this plays with the future of, uh, you know, there hasn't, haven't been a lot of people to really work the young Avengers into the broader Marvel continuity. I mean, they show up every once in a while, but most of the time they're just kind of set to the wayside. Um, this, this lets them live out their promise um, specifically Teddy Altman's promise um, as Hulkling. If you if you know anything about that character, he is he's a man of three worlds. He is part scroll, part Cree, but raised on Earth. Um, and kind of the legacy or his the legend of him was that he was always supposed to be the emperor uh, that was going to unite the Cree and the scroll, which are mortal enemies. If you know anything about Marvel's cosmic stuff, you know that Cree and scroll they don't they don't jive. Uh, they they don't like that's oil and water supposed to be right. So how is how is Teddy going to unite them? Something incredible has to happen. Uh, something uh, that is universal has to happen for that to, to work. Well, that's what Empire is. Uh, Empire is that universal threat. So something happens in Empire, um, in, in the Marvel Universe, uh, that really catches the attention of everybody. There's a reason why it's called Avengers and Fantastic Four. Like they bring in all the big guns um, to this. There is a species of, of kind of plant entities and they're called the Coati. And the Coati are, uh, they, they've got, there's, the legend behind them is that they were discovered um, round about the same time as the, the Cree Empire was. Um, and they were given they were basically put to the test, like, okay, who can build, take, take the seed and who can build the, the best things? Like you need to invent something with it. And, and the Cree did and the, the, the Kawadi did and inevitably the Kawadi won, like the thing that they did produce something that was beneficial to the entire universe. Well, what was the answer to that? Well, it was to, to crush them, to destroy them. Um, to which the, and, and forgive me, I haven't gone back and read it. I'm not sure if the, it was the creator of the scroll who did that. Um, essentially, it doesn't matter, long story short. Um, the Kawadi got all but wiped out. Now, you know, hundreds of thousands of years later, um, the Kawadi are back. They've, they've, they've shown back up and 
and they're they're presenting themselves as once again they're they're running from extinction and they've came to the moon um and they're you know they're looking for help and they essentially gear themselves up to the avengers and ask for the avengers to assist them because they're being chased across the universe well well who are they being chased by well they're being chased by a union of the scroll and the crees uh being led by none other than teddy altman uh the the scroll and the crees put aside their um issues their 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 you know legendary problems to unite against the coati which you know do you really hate this plant species that much you need to exterminate them and drive them to extinction that you would you would set aside years and centuries of of war well maybe and how did how did teddy altman uh get his position um and and the avengers can't quite figure this one out but they they're the avengers they're not going to let us an entire species go extinct especially when it's the scrolls and the kree that are chasing them i mean there's a history there right and so they square off um but the fantastic four they're they're not so sure they you know reed richards you know smart dude apparently uh, that's that's what they say about him uh he like something's wrong here um and by the end of the first issue, you realize that, yeah, in fact, something is wrong. Um, the the Kuwati are not what they seem. They're, they're exactly who they say they are, but they're not the peaceful, um, benevolent species that they presented themselves to. They're being led by somebody who, again, has his own prophecy to fulfill. Um, he is named Koi, K-O, uh, K-O-I. Um, he is the son of some figures that we know. Um, he is, he's the son of the swordsman, um, but also the son of Mantis. Uh, and he is, he is leading the Kawadi. Uh, Mantis, he, he essentially much being juxtaposed to Teddy Altman. He's the spe- he's the child of two species. Um, but the, the swordsman in this aspect is not, not necessarily the swordsman that we know. He is a version of the swordsman from the Kawadi. Um, and that's where Koi gets his power from. It's what makes him the leader. And he has raged war silently throughout the universe. And nobody caught on to it because, you know, they, he was he was strategic in what he was doing. And now he's came to Earth. Um, and Teddy Altman, leading the union of the Scroll and the Crees, has to stop him, even if he has to go up and face down people that he considers his mentors, the Fantastic Four, um, the, the, the Avengers. Inevitably, they realize what's going on, right? They, they realize that the Kawadi are a cosmic threat and that they do have to be beaten, but at what cost? Uh, you know, Teddy Altman is, is leading, Hulkling's leading a war machine, um, and he's got the most terrifying generals uh, that – the universe has ever seen. I mean, he's got the accusers from the, from the Cree and he's got the super scroll. The dude that killed his stepmother is one of his generals. Now, um, you know, the super scroll being a major part of fantastic four history, uh, you know, clerks a badass, but he's, he's a top tier soldier, man. He follows those orders and he's, he's a threat to, to everything that they know, but he does, he, you know, he's following his leader. Um, and that's who, that's who Hulkling is bringing with him to the fight, but not again, this is a story about subterfuge. Like this, this entire thing, everything about empire has been a story of uh, people not being what they appear to be. And something inside Teddy's inner war council is wrong. Uh, Like somebody there is hiding something. Uh, They are leading him to maybe make the the wrong decisions um, or telling him he's making the right decisions, but they're doing it for the wrong reasons. And they've got the wool pulled over everybody's eyes. Um, and, and part of that goes into the legacy of, of who Teddy's parents were and who his grandparents were. And, you know, you guys can go read the story to figure that out, but uh, inevitably that comes to a head. Uh, and and part, one of the bad decisions that they're trying to get Hulkling to make is to activate the pyre, P-Y-R-E. And the pyre is a, think of it as the nuclear option. Literally, it is meant to explode the sun. They, they are going to stop the Kawadi at all costs by destroying the universe as we know it, at least on Earth, um, you know, imploding the sun, destroying Earth, destroying everything around it. And, and they choose this option because what the Kawadi have done um, 
there's there's some science behind the idea that plants use pheromones that plants can communicate with each other uh, in real life and so the quality the you know Dan Slott and Al Ewing take this concept and apply it universally um, that they can transfer energy and matter throughout the universe uh, being the connection you know plants in every different sphere um, the x-men actually do show up in this because if you want to talk about plants right now uh, that have ultimate powers you can't ignore what's happening over in the x-men and the fact that they're able to teleport and get around um, and that they're on the moon where cyclops and wolverine and jean gray have set up their little their little hub um, but there's something called the death bloom and it's a type of plant that that allows it to take whatever a, any given planet's strengths are, adapt it, like take the genetics of it, map it to its own, and spread it out throughout the universe. Well, Earth has one particular substance that is nowhere else in existence that would really come in handy, uh, and that is vibranium. And they position themselves to take out Wakanda, and to tap into the vibranium store there. And if they're able to, if they, if the death blossom actually gets its roots into it, it's game over. So they're going to activate the pyre, which again, not good for anybody who lives on earth because it's the end of everything as we know. So the fantastic four and the Avengers have to come together in order to figure out how to stop the Kowati, but also stop, uh, you know, hulkling from activating the pyre and destroying the world and both of these things this ticking clock they're both going to happen at the same time they're both counting down like within they have to solve both of these problems within seconds of each other um do they i i don't know maybe you can figure that one out for yourself it's not hard <laughs> the marvel the marvel universe is not going to end as we know it um man th like the story aside there were some there were some great moments in this marvel did the thing that it usually does and they had a bunch of tie-ins that you really don't necessarily need to read unless you want to, but there were some really good wrap-ins to some characters that, that we really, that I really love. Um, one of which being She-Hulk. Um, now a lot of people got upset with one of the issues of this book because, uh, you know, spoilers as to everything, She-Hulk quote unquote dies. But, um, I don't know if anybody's been paying attention to a little book. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't even think we've talked about it on the show much, but um, it's called immortal Hulk uh, being written by Al Ewing, which is one of the best books at Marvel right now, in my opinion, if not the best. <laughs> yeah. We'd never talk. About uh, yeah. It. We, we never mention it. It doesn't get a lot of love on the show. Um, but you know, key, key in on the immortal part of that, which is what Al Ewing's really been playing with is that Hulks are immortal. So, you know, everybody kind of reacted in the way that, <laughs> you know, Hey, calm down, um, <laughs> chill out. Uh, because it all works out well in the end, at least. But uh, you get a great fight between She-Hulk and the Thing. It, it's it's awesome. You get some really beautifully drawn, epic moments to where everybody and their brother uh, in the Marvel Universe, all the heroes that you know and love show up, and they're just going to war. Um, Carol Danvers, <clears throat> excuse me, Carol Danvers gets to operate a... Uh, essentially Ronan the Accuser's hammer, <laughs> which is just good shit. Um, especially if you want to get back wow. to the, yeah, like the, the Cree and the, you know, their history with Carol Danvers as Captain Marvel um, and, and who Ronan the Accuser was in that whole line. Uh, she, she, she gets this universal weapon. Um, ultimately one of my favorite moments and one of the best things that come out of this book uh, uh, for me, I, I'm saying this for me. It's other people are probably like, "Oh yeah, we knew this was going to happen at some point. It's just a thing." But um, Wiccan and Hulkling actually get married in this book. And as somebody who has read Wiccan, who has read Hulkling, who has loves the Young Avengers ever since their their inception, uh, who who's been dreaming of this moment for you know as a as a dude who started reading this book as a young young gay person, that was just kind of cool uh, to see that brought in they you know they actually have two weddings one they do a drive-through wedding because you know the, the clock is ticking and they got to go so they they uh <laughs> wiccan poofs them over to uh to vegas <laughs> and they get married in a drive-through vegas parking lot um but the other one they get to have this they, they get to have their moment uh and everybody's there um you, you know everybody who's anybody kind of like the you know the other big gay wedding that happened in the X-Men where all the X-Men were there. Um, this one, you get all of the fantastic four, all of the Avengers, my girl Wanda's back there. You know, she's there. She's looking proud. She doesn't say a whole lot, uh, but she's there. Um, 
It's so in the middle of this intergalactic event of cataclysmic consequences, they stop to have a wedding? No, no, they wait till it's over. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, they, in, in the So middle, it's the celebration. Is a right, right. It's, it's the big, it. it's where you get the fireworks. Um, before the shit hits the fan, Wiccan, you know, teleports them over to get married. They come back, they split, uh, you know, cosmic universal events of, of great consequence happen. And then at the end of it, they, they all come together to, uh, to, to bring these two guys together in a really cool union. Inevitably my favorite part about this, cause you guys know I'm an art head is just seeing all of Valerio Shitty's layouts. Um, the, like the dudes playing with, you know, 30 characters and you get these amazing fights. The, the wedding scene is awesome. I like Valerio Shidi anyway. He's a great storyteller with his art. Um, you just get some of these really epic moments with people on, people, people on the screen together. Um, and that's what I love about the events. I know the events have a lot of problems. We get kind of event fatigue because it seems like there's always an event going on. And not all of them are good. I'm not making the argument that they are. But in the events, you get to see these giant line-wide culminating moments um, that that are really fun for a kid who who loves superheroes for a dude who loves Marvel uh, and you get the same thing over over in DC right if you if you love these these characters these line you know this entire publisher um, no matter what era of the universe that they are you get these moments and you have to cheese at them a little bit because it's just fun it's pure dumb fun and sometimes that's what you need in your books or in your life, just pure, cheesy, dumb fun. And that's what this book gave me. Also, Tony Stark made Mr. Fantastic an iron suit, and that's rad. Does it stretch? It does. Oh, that is awesome. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so, great. Iron Fantastic now coming to you? Hey, could be. Um, it's, it's, it, dude, it's, it's cool. Like, I, I've got nothing poetic to say about it other than like very giggly saying this was cool. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty cool. It was fun stuff, but, but you know what else is fun every other Wednesday? Well, not every other Wednesday, just every Wednesday or Tuesday. Now that DC is publishing new books where the new comics come out and they hit local shelves of your, um, oh, well, I, I say shelves, maybe they're hitting the quote unquote digital shelves of whatever we like to go over and visit our buddy, uh, Matt at Kapow Comics over in Sherwood here in central Arkansas. Great shop. Lots of fun people. Um, they are, are, you know, they, they, they are the reason we all know each other. Um, and every once in a while when we're not in the midst of a pandemic, we get to sit around in the shop and actually host this podcast from there. And that's fun. That's good times. So we, we love to give those guys a shout out there. There are non-monetary benefactors, if you will. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, if they want to give us monetary benefits, that's, that's also workable. Wink, wink, nod, nod, Matt. Um, <laughs> so um, hook, hook us up with that, bro. Um, anyway, go see your local comic shop or get ready to, uh, you know, log on and download some books. Uh, either any way you read comics, any way you want to read the new comics, doesn't matter as long as it's legal, as long as you're paying for them, as long as the people who make these things are able to get their cut for it. Um, and the stories are being able to be told. That's all that matters. Just don't, don't download them illegally. Cause then we don't like you anymore. Um, and that's no fun. So um, we'll, we'll go the way we talked about our, our bookie books, Matt, what are you grabbing this week? So I'm looking forward to reading Stillwater by Chip Zdarsky, Raymond Perez and Mike Spicer. This is a uh, horror book. Uh, horror and intrigue is what it's called. So I'm looking forward to this. Anything Chip Zdarsky does gets my attention. I usually try out anything he does. And for good reason. Right. Um, I'm going to point everybody towards Royal City hardcover uh, complete collection. This is a uh, Jeff Lemire's very human story of a family that lost their son and brother and how they all deal with this tragedy in their own way. It's uh, Lemire at the top of his game. In my opinion, everybody should read this book. I love that book. <clears throat> yep. And it's going to be pretty shelf porn. Oh, shit. Shelf porn is the best thing, right? It is. I, I love it. Um, we're kind of all in simpatico this week with what we're telling folks to go grab. Uh, so I think folks should go grab a new graphic novel called woods W O O D S. 
um, that's coming out this week from Birdcage Bottom Books. Uh, this is written by Mike Freeheit. Um, it's a horror story. Uh, it's kind of a horror story set in a uh, similar tone to <laughs> 2020. <laughs> um, you know, so maybe, maybe, you know, if you're, maybe you don't need to go read this book if you're in a, maybe a dark spot, but if you, it, it could be good. Um, I'm looking forward to it anyway. So this, this woman, uh, suffers a psychological breakdown after a powerful and terrible demagogue gets elected. Um, and so Th this this couple, her and her husband, go to a remote cabin uh, where they they try to make their own world in spite of increasingly volatile uh, political climate. Um, but while they are trying their best to overcome um, her break from reality, um, otherworldly arbiters conspire to change their lives forever. Um, Woods is a horror story. It confronts the trauma surrounding a loved one's battles with mental illness, questions of the struggle of individual engagement uh, in the collective, and imagines the possibilities of a world that transcends beyond earthly understanding. Kind of a Lovecraftian aspect to it um, in that sense. Uh, the cover art looks great. Um, it's kind of grim. Kind of like, and I say that in the Harry Potter sense of the black dog. Um, it's, it's a grim on the cover. So check it out. Uh, it's neat that we all kind of went to the away from the superhero aspect of things for that. Caleb's um, word today is neat. It is. I, sh I got to put a quarter in the swear jar every time I say that now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Well, I don't and they that. all have supernatural aspects. That's kind of cool too. Uh huh. I don't know why I'm saying neat 1700 times. I noticed that I was doing it. Yeah. As, as sometimes you do, uh, but I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> it's neat. It happens to all of us. It's my, it's my descriptive phrase of the day. Ooh, this is neat. Yeah. <laughs> fucking nerd. Well, I mean, when you're when you're recording live, you don't always have a, thes a thesaurus in front of you, so you that's, just do the best you can with the right, tools if, you have. But you know what it would be if I had a thesaurus in front of me? It would thesaurus be, Rex? I don't know. It, it would be neat. It would be neat if I had a thesaurus in front it of me. It would be neat. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> All right. Um, I enjoy this more than I have words, but alas, all things must come to an end. All good things and all bad things. And that's the important part to keep in mind is all bad things tend to come to an end too. Um, so if you want more of this, uh, you should head over and find, discover for yourself, uh, immerse yourself into our Facebook group. We Southern Fried Geekery uh, on the Facebooks, easy to get into. Um, come check us out. There's about 220 people there who would love to become your friend. Uh, we would love it if you joined us where we talk about all things and everything. Um, maybe if you're the, the Ultraman guru, uh, you want to you wanna jump on there. And I guarantee you, folks like Jerry would love to have a conversation with you about it. That, that's their, their bread and butter. That's their jam. Um, if you, if maybe Facebook isn't your thing, and that's cool. That's, that's completely understandable. We're also on Twitter and we're on Instagram. We're at SFG Podcast on both of those. Follow us. Uh, check it out. We're posting especially on the grams, we're posting, you know, pictures of panels that we like. Uh, we're posting art that we really did. We're shouting out to creators um, on the Twitter. Same thing. Uh, we share a lot of stuff that comes in. If there's new stuff being produced, published or promoted, we, we throw it up on the tweets uh, just to stay involved with that. It's where a lot of the, news he's, he's using the, the universal we, because <laughs> I ain't doing any. Of <laughs> What's the grams? <laughs> The grams. Oh, that's 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 my uh, millennial way of saying Instagram. Ah, uh, it's it's on fleek, um, as the kids say. Do they? Do they say that? I don't know. Fleek? I don't think they say. I don't think anybody says that anymore. I think that lasted about five minutes. It had a six short years window. Ago. It had a yeah. short window, and for good reason because it's terrible fucking phrasing, um, in <laughs> in my not so humble opinion. <laughs> so. Um, we hope you guys join us in those places. Would would love to get to know you. Get to chat. Uh, if you listen to the podcast, you, I guarantee you, you'll you'll like one of those things. Um, treat each other kindly. Take care of yourselves, and come back next week, same time, same place. Go forth and love some comics. Ooh. That was kind of weak. I'm I sorry. Need a, I need a better woo, Craig. Woo! There we go. That's the goodness. It's the hotness. That's neat. And that, that first one felt like uh, air leaving a balloon. Yeah, well, when it came out, I was like, that's bad. That's really bad. It was not neat. <laughs>